Find the Taylor series. He writes generated by it. That's, I mean, I guess it's a perfectly fine way of writing it. Series four, f of x equal to one over one minus x to the fourth at x equal to zero. Um, yeah. So there are a couple ways you could do this. You could do it kind of the, what I like to call the long way, like actually find the stuff. So, right, we could say, you know, here's my function, f of x is one minus x to the negative fourth. And then my first derivative is negative four times one minus x to the negative fifth times negative one, which is just four times one minus x to the negative fifth. So we can kind of start to see already that every time we take a derivative, the negatives are going to cancel out. So like the next derivative is going to be five times four times one minus x to the negative six. And the next derivative is going to be six times five times four times one minus x to the negative seven. And then when you start plugging in zero, you're just going to get a nice number. So like f of zero is going to be one. And f prime of zero is going to be four. And f double prime of zero is going to be um, five times four, so 20. Which I'm starting to see, fact, right? We're starting to see factorials. This is looking like five factorial over three factorial. This is looking like four factorial over three factorial. I probably should have gone one more before I started seeing this. This is looking like f prime, triple prime of zero is six times five times four, which is really six factorial over three factorial. This is looking like three factorial over three factorial. So I was going to start writing out the pattern. Of course, I don't really feel like I have enough room at this point. Um, but I'm seeing, gosh, I mean, yeah, I wish I had more board space. Um, so trying to write out the pattern for this. I see that one over one minus x to the fourth looks like, if I can remind you, it's going to be f of zero plus f prime of zero times x to the first plus f double prime of zero times x squared over the factorial. And it goes on. And so this is looking like, what did I say? I said something crazy. I said, this, so those are my f my derivatives. So I've got, I'm going to write it out with all the kind of stuff. So three factorial over three factorial, which I know is one. And then here I've got four factorial over three factorial. And I'm also going to put the one factorial, even though it's kind of silly, times x to the first. Here I'm going to have five factorial over three factorial times two factorial times x to the second. Here I'm going to have Six factorial over three factorial times three factorial times six to the third, and so on and so forth. So, if you actually want to write this using the sigma notation, it's actually not terrible at all. You can say it's the sum from n equals zero to infinity of, so let's see, I'm definitely going to have x to the n. And then it looks like on over here, I'm going to have, let's see, so it looks like I have n plus three factorial, right? Three factorial, four factorial, five factorial, all over three factorial times n factorial. That's, that's not, doesn't feel super easy to come by necessarily. Um, there is, there is a couple different ways to write this. I will point out that this thing here, this n plus three factorial over three factorial times n factorial is also more um, compactly written as n plus three choose three. There's another way of writing this. Um, but let me talk about another way to attack this problem because there is another way to attack this problem. So when I see one over one minus x to the fourth or really something over one minus x to any kind of power, I'm usually thinking that one over one minus x to a power looks a lot like a derivative of one over one minus x. Here's what I'm going to say. 
I know and you know that 1 over 1 minus x is just 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed, which we can write as the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of n times x to the n. Uh, well, uh, uh, no end there. Apologies. Which makes me feel like I'm a little, hmm. I'm a little, no, I guess that's all right. I feel a little weird about this. I'm not going to lie. This is the right formula though, right? We did the we did the right thing, right? I didn't do something stupid, I don't think. Well, we'll come back and see. So let's take a couple derivatives. So the derivative of this, again, this is one minus x to the minus first. The derivative is one minus x to the minus second. Right? I'm ignoring the, or I'm I'm simplifying the negative. Right? It's negative one times one minus x to the negative second times the derivative of one minus x. And that's going to equal the derivative of this, which is 1 plus 2x plus 3x squared plus 4x cubed, which we can just get by taking the derivative of this. So it's going to be n times x to the n minus 1. From n equals, we don't need the 0 term, because the 0 term is just going to give us 0. So from n equals 1, infinity. And then we can take the derivative again. The derivative of this is going to be 1 minus x to the minus third. The derivative of this is going to be, let's see, 2 plus 6x plus 12x squared plus so on and so forth. So taking the derivative here, yeah, this is going to work. It's just going to look a little different. We get n times n minus 1 times x to the n minus 2. This shouldn't be starting at 1 anymore, because if I plug in 1, I'm just going to get 0. So I'm going to be starting at Two. And finally, we take the derivative one more time. We get one minus x to the negative fourth equal to six plus 24x plus, sorry, I should have written the next term here. This was going to be the derivative of, sorry, 5x to the fourth is 20x cubed. And the derivative of that is 60x squared. And so this is looking like the derivative of this, which is going to be the sum from n equals 3 to infinity of n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times x to the n minus 3. Now, it might not look exactly the same as what we wrote on the other side, but it is the same. Right? If you look at, mm, I feel like I might have made a small mistake. I feel like I did. Hmm. I don't know. I feel like I made a small mistake somewhere. It's okay though. Um, okay, did I? Sorry, my brain is like, um, yeah. I feel like, I feel like somehow I had, hmm, yeah. I think I got an extra three factorial down here somewhere. Somehow I think I got a little extra. I feel like we need to check because this is why, this is why I really need more board space because they so you don't have to erase the things and then go back. So let's, uh, okay. Apologies for having to check the work here. Um, but I am pretty sure that this is right. So like my first term should, I should have something like this. Um, yeah, there are, I hate going back and checking what I already did, but let's go back and check it real quick. So our first, our function was one minus x to the negative fourth. The derivative was four, one minus x to the negative fifth. The derivative of that was five times four times one minus x to the negative sixth and so on and so on and so on. So our f, f of zero was one and f prime of zero was four and then f double prime of zero was five times four and then f double prime. And so when we start writing things out, we should be getting, so I mean, hmm, one over zero factorial and then four over one factorial and then five times 
times 4 over 2 factorial. Yeah, I'm sorry, my brain is not quite seeing. So if I write it out this way, Well, shoot, I thought I had something important to say, or at least worthy to say, but I feel like our things are looking very different here. So what's going on? That's a good question. So let's see what we've done here. Let's see what I've done here. I really, I really feel like now we need to figure this out because I've, I've, I've ruined it all for it. No, uh, let's see here. So. This is 1 over 1 minus x. It is equal to this. Seems reasonable. One minus, and the derivative of that is this, right? We're just doing 1 minus x with negative 1. It's negative 1, 1. Okay, cool. Good. It's definitely equal to the derivative of that. You can take the derivative of both sides, and you don't change the radius of convergence. That is definitely a theorem we have. Then we take the derivative again. Oh, James. Oh, James. I see what I did. I took the derivative again, and I kind of forgot an important thing. Yeah. And then we took the derivative again, and I kind of forgot an important thing. So really, if I want the thing I want, I actually need to divide by 6, which is 3 factorial. That's where that's coming from. OK. The world is not over. We saved ourselves. So this was correct having the 3 factorial down there, which means, yeah, we're good to go here with this 3 factorial. So I do want to point out that although this and the other one I wrote look a little bit different, right, so you got this one, and then this one over here, which is the sum of n equals 3 to infinity of n times n minus 1 times n minus 2. Over three factorial times x to the n minus three. These are really the same. And this one starts at zero, and you start with three factorial over three factorial times zero factorial. This one starts at three, and you start with three factorial over three factorial x to the zero. Right? They're the same. They just kind of index a little bit differently. Um, so what I was trying to show you, I might have didn't do a great job of doing, was that yes, you can use the Taylor formula to find this. And that's fine, but you can also, if you recognize something as a derivative of a known Taylor series, you can use that as well, which is, I don't know, you might feel like feel seems easier. I don't know, really. Like, is it easier to take the derivative of this one, two, three times and then divide both sides by six? Maybe. But to kind of Rodrigo, hopefully this kind of addresses your question about like what we are doing when we're doing this. But this is kind of the idea. We can take known power series and differentiate them to get other power series instead of having to use Taylor's formula. Cool. Um, let's do one more. I, I cautiously say let's do one more example because um, I do see another one here that I think looks kind of neat. Most of the ones where you're doing derivatives are going to look like a further power of, that's not even right, I say it. Let's look at this next one here. Um, so I see the power series, the Taylor, well, the power, the Taylor, oh, geez, words, Taylor series or McLaurin series, if you will, three plus X over one minus X. One way you could try to attack this one, which I don't think is the way to go, but I just want to find you could, is you could write this as 3 over 1 minus x plus x over 1 minus x. And then 3 over 1 minus x is 3 times the series from, I mean, maybe this will work. I'm just trying stuff. From n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n, right? 1 over 1 minus x, right? Do that. And then this is going to be plus x times the series from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n. The hard part about this, well, in fact, let's write it out. So this looks like 3 times 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed 
and so on and so on and so forth. This looks like x times 1 plus x plus x squared plus. So let's see. It looks like I've got 3 plus 3x plus 3x squared plus 3x cubed. And I've also got plus x plus x squared. Actually, this seems like it might work actually really well. Sometimes doing the thing that doesn't seem like it's going to work totally works out. So this looks like I've got 3 plus 4x plus 4x cubed squared plus 4x cubed plus so on and so forth. So it looks like I could write this, and the prompt for this problem definitely shows you writing your answer as blank plus the sum of other thing. So you could totally write this as 3 plus the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 4 times x to the n totally works. And my opinion, probably easier than using Taylor's formula. We can also use Taylor's formula. Um, it actually, I mean, I don't know. It, again, right, these problems are kind of like, you could go one way, you could go the other way. I was thinking of doing something totally different until I tried this. So the, the more normal way you could go, normal, is to Say, all right, we're going to use Taylor's formula. And, and the interesting thing about this is the derivative of this actually simplifies really nicely. So if your function is 3 plus x over 1 minus x, was it? Yeah. The derivative is bottom times 3 to the top, which is 1, minus the top, which is 3 plus x times the derivative of the bottom, which is negative 1, so it's negative plus over 1 minus x squared, and that's just going to equal the negative x and positive x cancel out 4 over 1 minus x squared. So then we can see that the next term is going to be, um, the next term is going to be 4 times 2 times 1 minus x to the negative third, sorry, that's a negative second there, apologies. And then the next derivative is going to be 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 minus x to the negative fourth. And then, right, you keep seeing this pattern happening with these kinds of ones where if you keep taking more and more derivatives, you get like a factorial. This is going to be 4 times 4 factorial times 1 minus x to the negative fifth. So it looks like the nth derivative here is going to be 4 times n factorial times 1 minus x to the negative n plus 1. That's what it's looking like to me. So then if we want to find the nth derivative at 0, let's see. The nth derivative at 0 is going to be 4 times n factorial times 1 minus 0 is 1 to any power is to 1. And that's true for n bigger than or equal to 1. But it doesn't work for the for the original function, right? F of zero is three. So then, using Taylor's formula, we're going to get that our function, which I'm just right, f of x is f of zero, right? It's the whole. I don't want to write. I don't know. Fine, you guys convinced me. But right, f of zero is three. And then every other f prime is 4 times n factorial. This is going to be 4 times 1 factorial times x. This is going to be 4 times 2 factorial over 2 factorial times x squared. The next is going to be 4 times 3 factorial over 3 factorial times x to the third. Right, you're just getting 4 times your x to a power. This is totally 3 plus 4x plus 4x squared plus 4x cubed which is just what we found before, right? And you couldn't even use the formula, right? You could do three, you could plug in what you actually found for the nth derivative, which is four times n factorial over n factorial times x to the n. But then you see the n factorial is totally canceling out. And you get exactly what we got over here. So let me say it for the 10th time. There are usually a couple different ways you can attack finding a Taylor polynomial. One way that's almost always an option is to just use Taylor's formula, start taking all the freaking derivatives in the world, 
and plug in your center and then try and find the pattern for the nth derivative at your center. Or you can try using derivatives or antiderivatives or adding, right? Like we didn't use a derivative or an antiderivative here. We just said, well, I can break this up as two things. And then both of these look like known series and we added them together and it happened to work out all right. And then you can reach my water in here. So Taylor series, fun for everyone. Um, where'd my mouse go? There it is. All right. Um, so we can do more of those if you guys want, but let's go ahead and if you want more, let me know. But I'm going to go ahead and kind of switch over to the other side of things. Um, we talked about the dot product last time. Let's talk about the cross product today and some of the applications of things. Um, we're, what I feel like we're moving towards here with the dot and cross product is eventually being able to find distance between various shapes in three dimensional space between a point and a plane, a line and a plane, a line and a point, right? There's like three or four different formulas that once upon a time I knew, but we're just gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you how to not memorize them, but to be able to fairly consistently, easily just figure out what they are. You might also want to memorize them or at least know whether or not you need to memorize them. Like I imagine, I like to imagine both with professors are like, you just have these formulas because they're kind of a giant pain in the butt to remember. But let's go ahead and talk about the cross product. So dot product, just a reminder. So if you've got, let's talk about, let's, let's kind of, I'm going to, I'm going to generally assume, oh, in fact, you really have to assume for cross product um, that our vectors are in three space, meaning we don't have higher dimensional vectors. You can have lower dimensional like vectors in two dimensions because you're just having the third dimension coordinate is just zero. But um, what I'll say is dot product. So if you've got u equal to the vector u1i plus u2j plus u3k, or some people might write this in various other notations, um, and v is v1i plus v2j plus v3k, then you can find the dot product between u and v by multiplying the corresponding components together and adding up all the results. And what I'll say is that for u and v, the analog of the dot product in higher dimensions makes sense. Right? If u and v were both four dimensional vectors, you can still calculate this very easily. Or if u and v were five or six or seven or eight or however many dimensional vectors, you can always just multiply the components together and add the results. And that definitely is something you will see in 22a. Like, right, you'll take the dot product of vectors that have more than three dimensions each. They do have to have the same amount of dimension, but you can be able to get that. Um, and then we also have, of course, that u dot v is equal to the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times cosine of the angle between them. Okay. On the other hand, the cross product is only really, only makes sense in actual physical space. You said there is no cross product of vectors that are higher than three dimensions. So this is the dot product. You'll notice the dot product has cosine in it, whereas the cross product, u cross v, is equal to, so there's again, there's going to be two different distinct ways of calculating. What, so also, I should really point out, so I know we talked about the right-hand rule last time a little bit. The right-hand rule says that if you take a vector, and so if you take two vectors, and you put your fingers in the direction of u, and you curl your fingers towards the direction of v, then u cross v, the resulting vector will result, will be, um, will be in the direction of your thumb. So, but what I really am trying to say in the longest way possible known to man is that u dot v is a scalar. Right. When you dot two vectors together, the result you get is just a number, like five or seven or negative two, right? You can cause or negative. On the other hand, 
when you cross two vectors together, the result that you get is another vector. So that's kind of a very important difference is that the cross product of two vectors gives you another vector. So which is one of the reasons we actually really are interested in the cross product because it's a way of multiplying vectors together and getting a vector back. So one way of calculating this is it's the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times sine of the angle between u and v. Now, so far, that's just giving me a number, right? Number times a number times a number. And then we have to multiply this scalar by the vector n, where, this is where this example gets kind of very interesting, where n is a unit vector, right? Whenever we're talking about direction, we usually want to make it a unit vector, meaning a vector of length one, so it's not affecting this. So n is a unit vector that is perpendicular to both u and v. Um, as determined by the right hand rule. Because technically, at least when you're thinking about three space, any two vectors, there are two distinct vectors that are perpendicular to both of them. So here's kind of the idea, right? If u is pointing this way, let's, let's pretend that u and v are both kind of in the flat plane. So u is pointing this way, and v is pointing this way. So like here's the angle between them. I don't really care what that angle is. So if you cross them together, right? So, so if I take a vector that's pointing straight that way in the plane and a vector that's pointing kind of that way in the plane, if I curl or cross my fingers towards that vector there, the resulting vector is pointing up. Again, right hand rule I use my right hand. Um, so the vector n is straight up, where it's perpendicular to this vector and also that vector there. Hopefully you guys can kind of see what I'm trying to draw there. Um, here is another picture in case you want to see. Let me share my screen for just one sec. Sure. So here is a picture kind of like that, right? So, right, I'm like, so we're pointing in the i direction, we're crossing towards the j direction, and our vector, our resulting cross product is in the k direction. Um, sorry, there's something else I want to say here. Is there something else I want to say? Oh, I don't know what to say. So, but the thing is that I will also mention that if you look at the vector in the opposite direction, which is negative n, that vector is also perpendicular to both of these vectors. So that's why we, we say as determined by the right hand rule, because it has to go in the correct direction. Um, also interesting fact, the cross product, unlike a lot of other ways of multiplying things together, is not commutative, meaning order matters. So if you do u cross v, sorry, here's v, you get the vector n. If you do v cross u, well then, to do v cross u, you have to put your hand in the direction of v, your right hand, and then curl your fingers towards u. But I can't curl my fingers backwards, I have to turn my hand over. And if I curl my fingers towards u, the resulting cross product is pointing down. So u cross v equals n, v cross u equals negative n, or I should say is in the, I should say u cross v is in the direction of n, v cross u is in the direction of negative n. And that's something that's also tr always true about cross products. If you cross it in one order, you're going to get the negative result of crossing it in the other order. Um, right, I'm parched. If I was playing poorly, let me go fill up my water bottle, which, which used to have a J on it that you could totally see, like there was a big old J for James. You can, it's rubbed off over the years. I'll be right back. Um, one sec.
Also, Alexa just informed me that today is National Pizza Day. I mean, I never need a reason to get pizza, but there's a reason I feel like you might have to have some pizza. Today. All right. Um, the other thing to take away from this, before we get really kind of jamming here, is that the magnitude of u cross v, so the magnitude of u cross v is just equal to this part here, right? Because the magnitude of this part is just one. So the magnitude of u cross v is the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times sine of theta. So when we're going to start trying to find the length of things, it's really going to boil down to if, you, if you're trying to find the length of something and you see that you're using cosine of an angle, you're going to use the dot plot. If you're trying to find the length of something and you see that sine of the angle makes more sense, you're going to use the cross plot. That's kind of, of all the things I can say about this three-dimensional distance stuff, that's probably like the biggest takeaway. If you see that your triangle needs to use cosine, that means you want the dot product to show up. If you think your triangle needs to use sine, that means you want the cross product to show up. Um, yeah, that's probably the most helpful thing I will say about this, possibly. Maybe, I mean, maybe I'll be a little helpful. Um, so just a couple more things. Oh, 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 yeah. Yeah, sure. So some of these, so most of the time I say, we're going to not calculate the cross product using this formula. There's a few vectors we can do, like the unit vectors in the x, y, and z direction. So, Right, here's x, y, z, and notably, so there's i, there's j, there's k. So we could actually just calculate the cross product by using the formula, right? i cross j is equal to the magnitude of i times the magnitude of j times sine of the angle between them. The angle between any of these three vectors is 90 degrees times the unit vector in the direction that the right-hand rule says it should be in. The right-hand rule says i cross j should be in the direction of positive k. But that's one, that's one, that's one. So i cross j is going to be k. And in a similar way, j cross k is going to be i, because if you do j cross k, your finger points in the positive x direction, you're sorry, your thumb, finger, your thumb, points in the positive i direction, and k cross j, or, or sorry, k cross i is what I was getting next, apologies, k cross i is going to be positive j. Right? You put your fingers in the z direction, cross them towards the x direction, your thumb points in the y direction. And then the other three are the negatives, meaning i cross j is k, j cross i is negative k, and k cross j is negative i, and i cross, sorry, k cross i is negative j. One way to remember these specifically is if it's in the right order alphabetically, you get the positive result, right? I before J, J before K. Oops, not this last one. Sorry, I said the big finger. It's not true. It doesn't work. I lied. Um, oh, maybe, or maybe I'm just writing down dumb things because I've definitely written down the wrong thing somewhere here. K cross I should not be the same either way. So K cross I should be positive J, meaning I cross K should be negative. J. Oh well, I got my alphabet to this work. It does not work. But the right hand rule does work. Okay. So, yeah. Where is that coming from? Oh, thank you. Sorry. There's actually, so there is a formula for the cross product that I'm looking at here that I'm like, that's insane. No one would ever do it. Oh, you could totally. Okay. So here is how one could use the cross product, which would be insane. Why would I show you these? Let's just jump, let's cut to the chase. So 
if one wanted to, they could say, if I want to find like, let's say I have two vectors, u equal to i plus three j and v equal to five i. Come on, plus two j. If I wanted to cross these together, I could actually foil the cross product or distribute the cross product. It does work that way. So if I wanted to find u cross v, which since both of these are in the xy plane, I know the cross product is going to be in the z direction. So I could actually do one plus three j, sorry, i plus three j cross with five i plus two j. And then I would just kind of distribute the cross product. I foil it out essentially. So I would have um, i cross five i. So the thing is, when you cross a vector with itself, you get zero. Because what's the what's the well in fact right if you cross a vector with itself i cross i you do one times one times sine of the angle which is zero which is zero so yeah the vector cross with itself is zero because the angle between the vector and itself is zero degrees and sine is zero is zero and then let's see pi cross two j is going to be two i cross j which we know is positive k. And then we can do 3j times cross, not times, cross with 5i. So that's going to be 15j cross i. And then finally, 3j cross 2j is going to be 0. OK, i cross j is k. j cross i is negative k. So the final result is negative 13k. It's going 13 in the downwards direction. But this is really kind of cumbersome, especially if your vector has three components, right? If there was an i, j, and k, and an i, j, k here, to do the cross product of all that, you'd have like, you know, i with j and k, and j with i and k, and k with i and j. You'd have like six pieces you have to do. It's just like a mess. There's an easier way. So here is the easier way using the determinant method. So here is how we do this more easily. So if you want to do it, let's just do this example again. So let's say we've got u, which is i plus 3j. And if you want the k component as well, and v is 5i plus 2j. So here's how we do this. So if you do it, you always write the, so if you're doing u cross v, you're always going to write the u vector on top of the v vector. So here's how I'm going to do it. write the components. And so I'm writing first just i, j, and v. And then I'm going to write the coefficients of u, 1, 3, 0, and the coefficients of v, 5, 2, 0. This notation here means the determinant which you'll learn more about when you take 22a. Um, there's a couple ways to calculate this. They're both correct. One way to do this, the way I usually like to do it, is it's going to be the following. It's going to be i times the determinant of this q by q matrix here. Plus, sorry, minus. So basically, I'm taking this, I'm crossing out the row and the column to get the remaining two by two determinant. And then for j, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to look at j. I'm going to cross out the row and column to get the remaining two by two determinant. And then plus, and it's always plus minus plus k, cross out first row, third column, and you're left with one, three, five, two. Okay, and now here's how you find the determinant of the two by two matrix. It's the product of the diagonals minus the product of the off diagonals. So the determinant here is zero minus zero. So you get zero i minus, the determinant here is zero minus zero. And the determinant here is two minus 15. 
which is exactly what we have before. There are other ways of doing this. Some people like to do the same way they, they write the, the, the first two columns again, and then they do these like downward diagonal things, like backward diagonal things. I feel like that's more of a thing that really want to do. And it's not hard to do this. Also, this method, the, the so this method that we just did, when you take 22A, can be extended to larger matrices. Whereas the method where you write more columns and then do this diagonal thing only works with these IDs. So it's also better to show you this way because it, it has further applications. All right, so there we go. U cross V is that. Let's do another one. Because that's how you're typically, that's usually the easiest way to calculate the cross product between two vectors. Okay, oh yeah, we got more we got loads of time. So let's look at another example. Let's say we've got the vectors u equal to 2i minus 3j plus k and v equal to i minus 2j plus 4k. And let's calculate both u cross v and v cross v. So u cross v, we're going to do the determinant always i, j, k first, then the components of the first vector, 2, negative 3, 1, then the components of the second vector, 1, negative 3, 4. This is going to equal Sorry, I didn't drink enough water earlier, and now it's like talking, so my voice is, my mouth and throat is like dry. Okay, so it's going to equal i times the determinant of that two by two, negative three, one, negative three, four, minus j times the determinant of this one, two, one, one, four, plus k times the determinant of this one, two, negative three, one, negative three. So that's going to equal, let's see, so negative 12 minus negative 2, it's going to be negative 10i. This is going to be 8 minus 1, so minus 7j. This is going to be negative 4 minus negative 3, so negative 4 plus 3 is minus k. So that's what we get there. And now we could, we could, do, oh, I'm going to do it the long way, but I just want to point out, that when we find v cross u, we already know what it's going to be. v cross u should be positive 10i plus 7j plus k. Right? When you cross vectors in the opposite order, you get the negative results. Um, I feel like the, this is called, when you have that kind of thing where you multiply things in the opposite order, I think that's called being anti-symmetric. Um, so I'm going to do v cross u again, i, j, k, but then I'm doing one negative three four two negative three one. So when I do this, it's going to be i times the determinant of one four two. Oh, sorry, <laughs> negative two four negative three one. And then when I do j, it's going to be one four two one. And when I do k, it's going to be uh, one negative two negative three. So let's see. So notably, right, I've, I've interchanged all the rows of these two vector matrices. And when you interchange any two rows or two columns of a matrix, it actually does change the sign of the determinant. That's something else you will see in 22A, um, which I imagine most of you are taking, right? It's usually, if you're taking the 21 series, usually the 22 series comes along. Um, I like 22A a lot, and I definitely, if you have, if you're taking it in the future and you have questions, you're welcome to come to office hour with me. I'm happy, more than happy to talk about it. Like it's one of my favorite subjects to talk about. So, yeah. I'm going to still see negative two minus negative 12 is 10. One minus eight is negative seven. So, minus negative seven plus seven i j. I don't know why. What's a sensible about this? Come on. And then finally, over here, we get, let's see, negative three. Minus negative four is negative plus four, so plus four. Totally opposite from each other, as expected. Okay, so let's do a couple things with this.
Um, let's see. Yeah, we can do that. I feel like I had a where'd you go thing I was looking for. I had an example I wanted to make sure I did. Sorry, it's hiding from me. One second. Oh, there we go. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah. Sure. Okay. So let's look at some examples. So I guess I should point out. No, I really shouldn't. I was going to say you could use this to find the angle between U and V, right? You could say that the, you know, you really shouldn't, though, like, right? You could totally say, right, U cross V, the magnitude of U cross V is the magnitude of V, the magnitude of V, sine of theta. And then you could say it's equal to the magnitude of this, so then it's all, but you shouldn't, right? If you're ever finding angle between two vectors, you definitely want to use the cosine of angle. Right, you want to use just the dot line to find the angle. So you never really want to use the cross product of any angle between two vectors. Um, let's take a look. So let's find a vector. Perpendicular to the plane. X plus two, Y plus three is equal six. Z. All right, so let's draw a picture. And if I'm drawing a plane, I'm usually thinking about trying to find all the intersects. So I can see, so find the intersect is just like two dimensions, find the x intercept of the other two variables equal to zero. So x is going to be six. Y is going to be three, and Z is going to be two. So my plane, oops, there's part of it anyway, right? It, it, wow, that did not, that's not my best drawing ever. All right, so here's my plane. It is like that. <laughs> um, and I want to find, a vector that's essentially kind of coming up out of it like that. So here's what we're going to do. To find a vector that's perpendicular to a plane, you have to find a vector that's perpendicular to two vectors in the plane, meaning we need to find two vectors in the plane and then take their cross coordinates. So this point here is 6, 0, 0. This point here is 0, 3, 0. This point here is zero, zero, two. And there's like a bajillion different vectors. I mean, there's like a few different vectors. So I'm going to say, like, maybe the vector from here to here. Is that right? Yeah, sure. So I like, can do this vector. So the vector from there to there, let's call that, um, I'll call that V. Sure, why not? So that's V. And the vector V is going to equal, um, let's see, six, negative three, zero. I don't even want to write zero, okay, but I guess I will. And the vector u from, let's say from here to here, let's see, so zero minus zero is zero, and zero minus three is negative three, and two minus zero is two. Right? So those are two vectors that are in the plane, right? If they connect points that are in the plane, they have to be in the plane. And then we can take their cross product. So let's do u cross v. The, the cross part does not get an error a little bit. So u cross v is equal to, we're gonna, let's see, zero minus three, two, six minus three, zero. Let's see what we get here. We're gonna get, so I'm gonna try and do this calculation. Da, 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 da. And then I times the, Term of negative three to two, negative three to zero, minus j times the term of zero to six zero, plus k times the term of zero to negative three to six negative three, 
So it's going to be, uh, let's see, zero minus minus six is six i, zero minus 12 is minus 12j, so right, minus minus 12 is plus 12j, and then zero minus negative 18 is plus 18, so plus 18. Okay. So check this out. The normal vector, and that's why we use n for normal mean term. The normal vector is. 6i plus 12j plus 18k. And it's really, really worth noting. Uh, yeah, I'm going to write it here. That if I wanted to make it some factoring, this normal vector is equal to 6 times 1i plus 2j plus 3k. And it is not at all a coincidence that the if you that the coefficients of the different unit vectors correspond to the co coefficients of the variables in the plane. That is not a coincidence. That happens every time. So if someone had said to me, Find a vector perpendicular to the plane. What have we got here? I don't know. Um, 5x minus 17y plus 9z equal to 1. I wouldn't have to do any work. I would say, oh, my vector is 5i minus 17j plus 9k. Totally works. Every time. So if you know the equation of a plane, if you know the coefficients of x, y, and z, and you're equation of the plane, you know a normal vector. Now, if they wanted us to find the unit vector, we'd have to do the dumb thing where we take this vector and then divide it by its magnitude. So the direction of the normal vector. Would be kind of silly. It'd be one divided by the magnitude of n, which is ugh. nobody wants to find that. It's the square root of five squared plus negative seventeen squared plus nine squared, which is yeah, times it's five squared plus seventeen squared. Okay. That's not really the point, though. Um, so the cool thing about this is that then we can also kind of go backwards, meaning if someone asked us to do the opposite thing, we would be thinking of doing that as well. For example, if someone said, find the equation of a plane. Uh, I should say the plane containing the point Um, zero to negative one and normal or perpendicular to the vector. What have we got here? Three i minus two j minus three. There are two ways to think about this. The easy way, which is just, well, look, if I know the normal vector, I know the, the coefficient of x, y, and z. I know my equation is going to be 3x minus 2y minus z equal to some constant. But I also know the plane has to contain this point. So if I plug in 0 for x, 2 for y, and negative 1 for z, I should be able to find z. So 3 times 0 minus 2 times 2 minus minus 1 equals z. So minus four plus one minus three equals. So the equation of my plane is going to be three x minus two y minus z equal to negative three. Kind of slip. Maybe not. Maybe you've seen this before. You're like, yeah, big deal. Okay, fine. Um, here's kind of the rationale for why this works. So the longer way to think about. It. So like the problem with this, at least my problem with this, has always been in the past. Like, 
I kind of forget why this works. I'm like, oh yeah, I know it's the coefficients, but like, why is it the coefficients? Here's why. So let's say we've got this plane. Not the kind that flies, the kind that's flat. And we want to find the equation of this plane. And here's what we know. We know that the normal vector, wow, that looks fairly perpendicular to the lines there. Okay, the normal vector, wow, it's not my best drawing. Okay. The normal vector is that thing, right? Three i minus two j. And we can say, we don't know what this point is here. Let's call it x, y, z. Let's see, let me make sure I'm not doing something stupidly. Oh, no, actually, I'm going to say that's the point zero, two, negative one. Sorry. So zero, two, negative one. That's the point right there. And then let's pick any other point in the plane. Let's call that x, y, z. So we know that this vector and this vector are perpendicular, right? If n is normal to the plane, it is perpendicular to any vector in the plane, including that one. So let's call this vector v for a second. v is equal to, well, how do we write the equation of a vector? If we know the endpoints, it's this minus that, this minus that, this minus that. So it's x minus 0i plus y minus 2j plus I don't have enough room. Sorry, it's terrible. Plus uh, z minus minus 1 times j. Okay, that vector and that vector are orthogonal to each other, meaning their dot product should equal 0. So it should be true. The n dotted with v is equal to zero. But we know how to calculate n dot v. It's the coefficient of i times the coefficient of i plus the coefficient of j times the coefficient, right? You just multiply things together and add it up. So it's going to be, hey, what? Three times x plus negative two times y minus two. Minus one plus negative one times z plus one equals zero. But look, we're getting exactly the same coefficients of x, y, and z. We're getting three x minus two y plus four minus z minus one. And then if we bring these over, we get exactly three x minus two y minus two equals negative. That's the long way of seeing it. So the reason that this works is exactly because the normal vector dotted with any other vector that ends at the x, y, z in the plane has to equal zero. I think this would be a quick, kind of cool. I think all these formulas are kind of neat. Like it's it's interesting how this stuff kind of plays out. Um, they're just a pain to remember. Let's talk about someone definitely asked about the area of color parallel again. parallel um, Someone did ask me about the question in section 12.5. I don't think we're going to get to that today because I feel like I feel like we should build the machinery of all the things so that you guys can see examples. I don't just want to skip over things. Um, he says before then trying to think about maybe we should do that. I don't know. We'll see. I'm trying to remember what the problem was. Let me look, Oops, in the book. look real quick before I say yes or no. Why am I hiding things from myself? Everywhere is the answer. There's the book. That question asks specifically if I'm distance from the point to the line. We might get there today, we might not. We'll definitely get there on Thursday, if not today. Um, sure. We can talk about the area. So let's let's talk about some area things and volume things. So the area of a parallelogram, which is really just fun to say. Parallelogram. Also, it kind of reminds me of polygon, is what I really think I'm thinking of here, which is not all right, but I'll think of it. Um, sorry. So, area parallelogram, parallelogram. Let's take a look. Here's my parallelogram, which just means opposite sides are parallel to each other. 
I will remind you all the rectangle is a parallelogram. It's just one where you also have that uh, the angles have to be the same as well. So if I call this the base and this the height, and the area is just base times height. We can find the height in terms of how long this is here. So I'm going to call this u for a second and draw it like a vector. And I'm going to call this v so that oh, area is really, well, let's, let's find height first. So let's see. If I look at sine, sine of beta is the height divided by the magnitude of the vector. So it looks like the length of the height is the magnitude of u times sine of theta. Okay, that's promising. We'll get there in a second. So it looks like then the area is the base, which is the magnitude of v, times the height, which is the magnitude of u, times sine of theta. And hey, look at that. That is exactly the magnitude of V cross U. Kind of cool. So I guess we should like, I guess we could do an example, right? Um, so for example, I think I have an example over here. One sec. But yeah, the cross product of two vectors can geometrically, the cross product of two vectors can always be thought of as just a the magnitude of the vector that is the cross product of two vectors, right? Because this, right, this, this, this area isn't the cross product of two vectors. The magnitude of the cross product of two vectors can always be thought of as the area of the parallel that you can create from them. It's kind of interesting. Um, where's the example I had? I thought I had an example here. Maybe I'm just fooling myself. I guess we can just make one up. I just hate it when I think I have an example ready to go and it's like, fooled you, James. You were just lying to yourself. All right. Anyway, that's still like not that big a deal, but let's go ahead and do one anyway. I know what I'll do. Yeah, I'll do that. So, yeah. Sure. So let's say we have, I don't know, these two vectors. And let's just do it. I mean, it feels almost arbitrary to do this, right? Like, so here's one vector. Fine. Right, let's draw a thing. Here is a parallelogram, kind of. Now let's say the points on the parallelogram are, I don't know. Let's say, let's make it super easy. Let's just call this the origin. Let's say this is the point I went over five, and up one, maybe four. I don't know, something like that. And here I've gone something else. I've gone two, three. Right, I'm just kind of making stuff up, right? And I know my orientation is probably kind of backwards. But, right, so if we know these two points, well, we can totally find the area of this. So the area is going to be all right, this is not super exciting. Um, let's find the cross product first. So the cross product of this vector and this vector. Order doesn't matter because we're going to find the magnitude of this. So you can do v cross u or v cross u. Doesn't really matter. So let's do u cross v, which is going to be i j k. U is going to be the vector five i one j two k, and v is going to be the vector two i three j one k. 
And calculating this is going to be I times the magnitude of, sorry, the determinant of this matrix minus J times the determinant of psi of T one plus K times the determinant of phi one, two, three. And then calculating this is going to be, let's see, one minus six is negative five, five. Five minus four is one, so negative one J. And 15 minus two is 15 K. So then the magnitude of U cross V is going to be the square root of negative five squared plus negative one squared plus 13 squared. Which is going to end up equaling the square root of 195. So that is the area in this parallelogram that I needed. There's also another formula that's kind of interesting. It's the volume of a parallel pipe. So that's just taking a parallelogram, or actually, no, a rectangle. More I mean, yeah. And also giving it some height. So here's a parallel pipe head. Let's say we have this. So I got to try and draw this a little bit. Um, let's do it this way. Already starting to suck. All right. And we're going to get some depth. Yeah, you guys are like, okay, sure, James. It is meant to be like tilted, right? It's not just. Wow, I feel like I lost the corner there. Yeah, yeah, maybe no, good guy. Holy smokes. Okay. Hopefully that is somewhat reasonable to see. Um, and so I want to explore. How much we're off the vertical I'll look at that here very clearly. And I'm imagining that the bottom of this parallel pipe is kind of flat like in the XY plane. Um, so let's say that this is our vector u. This is our vector v. And this is our vector w. And we know that this vector here is in the direction of u cross v. OK. So volume of parallel pipe bed is base times height times, sorry, base times width times height. So the volume here is going to be the area of the base. Which we already know how to calculate. The base is just a parallelogram times the height. Okay, so that's going to be the area of the base, which is going to be u cross v in magnitude. Make sure I'm not doing something stupid here. No, that seems right. Okay, the u cross v in magnitude. Now let's talk about the height. So let's look over here for just one second. So I want to find the height of this thing. So if I've got like W like this, I want to know the height. I'm trying to figure out what this amount is here. Well, that's theta and that's W. Which trig function do I need to use? Sine or cosine? And the answer is the answer is cosine, right? Cosine of this angle is adjacent or hypotenuse. So cosine of theta is the height divided by the length of the vector w. That means the height is the magnitude of w times cosine of theta, which means that the height here is the magnitude of w. So here's kind of the interesting thing. 
to find the volume of this parallel pipe bed, it's the magnitude of this vector times the magnitude of this vector times cosine of the angle between them. But that's just the dot part. So this could be thought of as u cross v dotted with w, the magnitude. We need the magnitude there just to make sure it doesn't accidentally be negative. Right? You, could, you could have a, right? it is possible that u cross v dot of w gives you a negative value where it should be calculating the positive volume. And it's kind of bizarre. It's called the triple scalar box breaker. Interesting. Um, we could actually do an example if you guys wanted. Let's see, do I have an example? Sure. So let's say, yeah, yeah, for sure. So, let's, so I'm, I'm not going to draw a new picture because this picture is good enough for James and, and I think we can make it work. So let's say we know the points. Let's say we know where all these vectors end. So this point here, A, is let's say it's one one one. This point here, B, let's say it is what do we got here? Sorry, two zero three. This point here, which I'm going to call D. This point here I'm going to call C. C is four one seven, and D is three negative one. Now, here's what I'm going to point out. Three, negative, one, negative. It doesn't matter which vector you call u, which vector you call v, and which vector you call w. Right? You can totally do it where this vector is u, that vector is u, that vector is w. As long as you do the cross product of two vectors, dot it with the other vector, and then take the magnitude of that result, you're going to get the answer. I'm going to do it in a different way than it was done. Um, on the handle in the unit, just to kind of show the point. So, um, yeah, let me, I think I can erase something. Of this. So, we just need that one. Here. So, instead of, or instead of, let's, let's say, instead of renaming them, I'm just going to do, I'm going to do W cross V. Okay, let's write down what our vectors are. So u is 2 minus 1, 0 minus 1, 3 minus 1. So u is 2i minus j plus 2k. And v is the vector 4 minus 1, 1 minus 1, 7 minus 1. So 3i, 0j. 6k and w is the vector 2, negative 2, negative 3. 2i, negative 2j, negative 3. Let me double check the notes just to make sure I'm not making a dumb error. I knew I am making a dumb error. I did make a dumb error, right? So when I did when I did this first one, I did 2 minus 1 and somehow wrote down 2. There's a dumb error. Good to check your work. Make sure I didn't make any other stupid errors. Again, okay, everything else looks good. So now I'm going to do W cross V. So W cross V. I'm going to do I, J, K. W is going to be 2, negative 3, negative 3. V is going to be 3, 0, 6. And when we cross these, we're going to get, let's see. Um, I'm going to try and do some of the work without showing all. So if I do the determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix, I'm going to get negative 12 minus 0. So it's going to be negative 12i minus, if I do the, cross, the determinant of the matrix where I cross out you know, the middle row, it's going to be this and this. I'm going to get 2 times 6 minus negative 3 times 3. It's going to be 12 minus negative 9, which is 21. So it's going to be minus 21. Uh, J, and then finally, K times zero minus negative six, which is positive six. All right, 
So then we're going to take that vector and dot it with u. So this is my w cross v. Now w cross v dotted with u is going to equal, let's see. So here's u. So it's going to be negative 12 times 1 plus negative 21 times negative 1 plus 6 times 2, which is going to equal negative 12 plus 21 plus 12, which is 21. Now, if it had turned out negative, I would just slap an absolute value on it um, because we should have, it should be the Right, so I'm finding the magnitude of this. Um, or I'm sorry, but yeah, I should, I should. I should just really have absolute value. So. Another way to do this, interestingly enough. So there is an alternate method, which is just kind of cool, which I suppose I will say since we only have a minute left anyway. Another way to calculate this is what's called the triple scalar box product, where instead of finding the cross product, and then dotting with u, you can actually just put the u, the, the, you can put all three vectors in the, in the determinant. So check this out. So if I wanna find, what did I do over here? I did w cross v dot u. If I wanna find w cross v dot with u, and I want to find the magnitude of that, equal to the dot pro the, the determinant of the vector where we're writing w, v, and u over there. So w was, I'm just going to pretend like I still know them. w was 2, negative 2, negative 3. v was 3, 0, 6. And u was 1, negative 1, 2. Double check just to make sure that's right. Yeah, there's W, there's V, go, go, U, yeah, okay, cool. So let's check this out real quick. So to find the determinant here, again, we're doing the same thing. So now we don't just have one I, C, and K, we have actual numbers. So this would be two times the determinant of this. But if you think about this, right, we're really just dotting together the component of W with the other component of the cross product of the other two vectors. So it's, it's like you're doing the dot product and the cross product all in one. You're doing the cross product of these two vectors dotted with this one, even though it's written like the other way. It doesn't really matter which way you do it. Kind of cool. So minus, minus two times the determinant of that. And finally, plus negative three times the determinant of three zero. Okay, so we end up with two times zero minus minus six plus two times six minus six. I'm worried. <laughs> minus three times three minus zero. I'm oh, sorry, negative three minus zero. So I end up with two times six is twelve plus zero plus nine, which is going one. 